This is my cat. Say hello to the people. Yeah, he's not super keen to be on camera. Today, I thought I'd talk to you about pets and mounts and the impact that they can have on your story and on your world. Welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. So what got me thinking about pets and mounts is that I was recently rereading The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. And in The Dresden Files, there are two pets that play a very central role in the story. The first is Mr. the Cat. As far as we know at this point, Mr. is just a cat. He's a big cat and he's a cat with a lot of personality, but he is just a cat. Then there is Mouse, the temple dog or foo dog, who has a bark that can act like a fire alarm in waking people up and who has a semi-mystical bite. So he actually has some magical abilities. These two pets play different roles in the stories. Mister provides us with a grounding element into Harry's character. We know how much we love our pets. We know that our pets are dear to us and that their welfare is important to us. And because Mister's welfare is important to Harry, it provides us with the continuous message that Harry is a good guy. Yes, he has flaws. Yes, he makes dubious decisions sometimes. But he is committed to the welfare of his cat and he worries about his cat. And that grounds us into his character. The role played by Mouse is more that of non-human companion. It provides us with additional world building that creatures like this foo dog exists. Creatures that innately use magic do exist. And it provides us with an ally for Harry that doesn't constantly need to be in communication with him. Sometimes you just need a companion support without the complexity that comes with human-to-human -human relationships. Jim Butcher, of course, is not the only one to leverage this kind of support. In Harry Potter, you have the owls that are used to carry messages, Crookshanks, who is somewhere between a companion and a familiar and a pet. In The Last Airbender, you have Momo, who provides a lot of levity and interaction, and you have Appa, who of course is very central to the story in that he is the character's mount and their means of getting from point A to point B. But the element of the pet side of things that I really want to explore is that of Persa from the Rowan, which is a story by Anne McCaffrey in her Talent and Tower series. Persa is actually a mechanical teddy bear that is given to the Rowan child in order to provide her with what amounts to a support animal, except an electronic support animal, that also has extensive monitoring equipment. The role played by Persa is firstly that of support animal to the Rowan. So the Rowan child in the beginning of the book goes through this extremely traumatic experience where a mudslide wipes out her whole family and the village she was born in. The Persa therefore provides her with emotional support in getting over this tragedy. But she becomes attached to Persa long past the point where she should have been weaned off this little animal. Then she goes on a holiday with some other children and one of these children destroys the Persa and the destruction of this pet completely closes the door of her childhood. It is a fundamental growth experience for the Rowan child and something that stays with her for the rest of her life. So you can use pets in this way to provide deep impact, deep emotional impact on a character to grow them from being here to being over here through the things that happen to their pets as a surrogate for the things that happen to themselves. This is not quite the same with companions. Mouse, the foo dog, is more of a companion to Harry, but for a real masterclass in what companions are and what they represent, 
we should turn to Robin Hobb and Fitz Farseer's companion, Night Eyes. <coughs> Night Eyes is the third creature that Fitz wit bonds with. Now, this is an element of magic that allows a human and an animal to bond. There is a scene where Fitz is being tortured to death and Night Eyes draws Fitz's consciousness into his own consciousness and carries Fitz away while his body dies. Later, there is then a magician who brings Fitz out of Night Eyes's mind and puts him back into his body. After Night Eyes dies, he continues to serve as a spiritual advisor to Fitz and stays with him for all of his life. It is probably the most poignant, touching, and most fundamentally impactful animal companion in fantasy writing today. And I highly recommend this series to anybody who has not yet read it. So you can have companions that choose of their own free will to support your main character. And this allows you to have relationships that are unconditional in their support because it's not limited by the human to human relationships that we so often have. The animal can have a relationship with a human that goes far beyond what a human to human relationship would bring because you can break the rules of how we interact with each other. But you can also have animal companions that come from divinity, that come from the divine. This is very well done by Mercedes Lackey in the Storm Trilogy. Now, spoiler warning for Mercedes Lackey's Storm Trilogy. So in the Storm Trilogy, our main character, Carl, is graced by the presence of a fire cat called Ultra, who is a messenger from the god Vacundus. Ultra serves as a mentor to Carl, as well as a companion and advisor in the situation that Carl finds himself in. So you can use animal companions as kind of a line from God to the character if you have a lot of divine action going on in your story. It's also used in this fashion by Tamora Pierce in the Song of the Lioness Quartet, where the main character is sent a cat with purple eyes. Small spoiler warning, when the cat dies, she is turned into a constellation of the goddess, which is just such a sweet moment of reward for the reader to know that the pet isn't just killed. It, becomes, it goes back to its home in the sky where it is a constellation for the goddess. There is a third category of this kind of animal companion, and that is that of the mount. For me, mounts are slightly different from companions and from pets because they provide, in addition to everything else, they provide a means of transportation. In the non-magical mounts, I would be remiss in not calling out Faran from David Eddings' Sparrowhawk series. He is just a normal horse. Faran is just a horse. But he is a horse that is intelligent and that has loyalty to Sparhawk and has his own personality. So much like Mister in the Jim Butcher books, Faran grounds us in the character of Sparhawk and in the way that Sparhawk behaves. Mercedes Lackey also uses mounts in terms of companions who are the mentors and mounts of her heralds in the Valdemar books. She uses a form of reincarnation where very wise heralds can choose to be reincarnated as companions who are in the shape of white horses, and they can communicate mind to mind with their riders. So they bring not just the transportation, but also the mentorship and guidance of a wiser head to our younger, normally coming-of-age protagonists. And then, of course, in the mount category, I must mention The Dragons of Pern by Anne McCaffrey. So the dragons bond with their riders when the dragons hatch from the shell. So the rider is most often the mentor of the dragon. But, of course, dragons come with fire breathing and flight and the ability to fight thread, and they immediately turn the person that they've chosen into a dragon rider who then lives in the weir and becomes part of the dragon rider community. 
If you've never read The Dragons of Pern, I highly recommend the books. They are a lot of fun and a great science fantasy setting. I do feel that I should address a separate category, which is familiars and companions in a D&D style. So here I'm talking about animals that add an actual mechanical effect to their friend, to their human friend. The best known example of this is Gwen from the Drista Erden books. Gwen is an astral panther that Drista Erden uses as his ranger companion. She can manifest for 12 hours out of the day and runs with Drist. Her bond with Drista Erden is one of the most beautiful things about those stories. And their commitment to each other really illustrates how, despite the fact that they are tied together with mechanics, there is more to their bond than just the mechanical. Certainly, I think that if you utilize familiars or animal companions in your D&D world, you should think about what that bond means to the character who has it and what that bond means to the animal companion in question. They might not be human, but they are certainly a member of your party. And that is my take on pets and mounts in a fantasy world. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just in Time Worlds, and I will see you soon for another one.